We all have goals, especially career goals, like enhancing and diversifying our skills or tapping into a broader network of opportunity. The Cornell Executive MBA is designed for goal achievers from any industry by advancing your career without any interruption, by providing global perspectives and intimate classroom settings, by challenging, informing, connecting, and propelling you. Achieve your goals with the Cornell Executive MBA on the weekend and close to home. Search My Cornell EMBA to start your journey. This is The Guardian. The takeover of the city has triggered deadly scenes of panic at the airport as people desperately try to leave. Last month, the UK and other countries raced to evacuate people from Afghanistan as the Taliban retook control. At Kabul airport, the desperation is dangerous. Thousands of American... And British Chaotic scenes showed men, women and children desperately trying to escape a country that suffered years of instability and conflict. Outside the gates, shots ring out. At least two people have died today. Perhaps more. The UK government has promised to resettle up to 20,000 Afghans over the next five years. Arriving in the UK last night, British citizens and their Afghan allies, some of those who have now fled Kabul after the... Time. And it's easy to assume that for those who come here and make it to safety, their struggles are over. But in fact... The psychological impact of trying to resettle can bring a whole new set of challenges. From The Guardian, I'm Anand Jagatia, and this is Science Weekly. Afra is someone who knows the long journey of resettlement only too well. I used to work as an English teacher <laughs> in primary school. In 2011, she was living in Aleppo, in Syria. But when the revolution started, she was arrested for joining peaceful protests. After she was released, she moved to the rebel zone to work as a humanitarian activist. So I was working in protection and education and in the hospital. And my children were all the time with me. We are running from bombing and shelling. We were waiting for the ceasefire to just to entertain the children, drawing in the walls or even coloring, you know, the rockets that didn't explode. Living in a city that was under siege with three young children was an incredibly stressful and perilous existence. They decided to stay and help for as long as they could, but as the situation worsened, eventually the only option was to flee. After several years in Turkey, Afra managed to secure a visa for the UK. But that meant temporarily saying goodbye to her husband and her kids and undertaking yet another journey into the unknown. So when I arrived to the airport, I told the police I want to ask for asylum. And he told me why. I told him because I am a Syrian. And I started crying, crying all the time. All my fear in that time, uh, that hidden fear, I, f- I felt like exploded suddenly. And she soon realised that she knew almost nothing about the country that she'd just landed in. I arrived in 2020, so they are waiting (laughs) for the decision for, uh, you know, that... Brexit? Brexit, yeah. And there was a guy looking at me. He was an Arabic man. (laughs) And when he told me we are worried because of Brexit, I told him, whoa, what's Brexit? (laughs) (laughs) All all these people were laughing at me. You don't know even the country you are coming (laughs) Of course, Brexit was just the first of many unfamiliar things that she would encounter. And eventually, she was able to arrange for her family to join her. And yet, so often, when we hear about the experiences of someone like Afra, the story ends here. But what happens next? I'd like to ask your listeners to just imagine that they're arriving in a strange country on their own, where they don't speak the language... They don't know the system, they don't know the culture, 
and all the different things they have to manage. This is Rachel Tribe. She's a professor of applied psychology at the University of East London, and she spent years working with asylum seekers and refugees. The asylum process can take a long time. Um, it can be months. It can occasionally be years. And somebody described it as living in a liminal state, that they want to put down roots, but they can't because they don't know if they're going to be deported. They can't return home. And on top of this, it can take time for people to really process what it is they've been through. Something Afra experienced. In Syria, I wasn't have time even to feeling depressed because we are all the time up down, up down. So the adrenaline in your in your blood. But when I moved here, something happened for the process. So my trauma started. My flashback to the situation that I lived in Syria. The nightmares started not just me, even my children and my husband. Having to deal with so much trauma and change can have a dramatic impact on people's mental health, but understanding exactly how that manifests can be complicated. What we're not talking about here is a diagnosable mental illness, which is what people sometimes associate with mental health. So many people may suffer from anxiety or depression or perhaps post-traumatic stress disorder or complex trauma. But often this, I would argue that this is a very normal reaction to abnormal events. Being forced to leave everything and everyone you know and love, hearing what Afra has lost, that cannot but affect you adversely. So I think we, we need to think about that as well as the tremendous resilience that, that people often show. I mean, do you have to be careful then in, in your work about over medicalizing people's experiences and, and you know trying to make sure you treat them as a, as a whole human being a whole person absolutely and i'm actually going to mention here um, an ex-colleague of mine came to the uk as a refugee and then actually qualified as a psychologist and he's written about how when he first came mental health professionals were treating him as a victim and actually he saw himself as a survivor and that he actually wanted to be seen for the whole person. I mean, I think becoming an asylum seeker or a refugee is always a really, really significant part of somebody's life. But it is only part of somebody's life. So given all of this, what's the best way to offer someone help? Well, Rachel told me that therapy can work for some people, but it comes with challenges. For example, there may be language barriers. I certainly wouldn't like to uh, try and explain my emotional state in a second language. People may require interpreters. There may also be cultural barriers. Being asked to talk to a total stranger can present something of an enigma to some asylum seekers. There may be notions of stigma. They may assume that it will be genetic, that the family will be stigmatised, that it could adversely affect marriage prospects. They may also assume that a mental health professional is part of the asylum-seeking process, so that may influence how they talk about their distress. So are you saying that people might think what they tell a therapist could be held against them during their asylum application? Absolutely, that's what I'm saying. So it's really important that they actually spend just a little bit of time trying to explain what they're doing and why they're doing it. So it sounds like seeing a psychiatrist or a psychologist isn't going to work for everybody. So are there other things that you can try and do? I mean, one of the things I did, which um, was rather unusual, perhaps, was that I was working in an organisation that was dealing specifically with with survivors of organised violence and torture. And we actually put together a football team, which was actually very successful because we ended up having two players who had been international players in their countries they had flown from. And what it did was, as well as um, giving people a sense of community, they belonged to the team, and there was also something about regaining a sense of their physicality, 
and as well as actually playing football, we used to run regular sessions where the team members were able to talk about their feelings and it provided a way of both supporting them, of processing and also of sharing coping strategies. I mean, you're touching there on lots of things that we all need in order to have good well-being and mental health, right? I mean, a sense of purpose, belonging to a community, having friends. Absolutely. And I think what they can additionally do is also uh, bring some structure into our lives. If somebody is an asylum seeker and is not allowed, sadly, at that time to work, it can be very, very difficult. I think we also need to think about how important and how part of people's identity is their role either at work, their dignity, things like status, also recognising, thinking very carefully about the language we use. Asylum seekers and refugees are often called scroungers and a, a series of, of, of racist terms and actually just give a very, very um, skewed view of the reality of what many um, asylum seekers and refugees contribute to our society. Many refugees who come are highly qualified professionals who bring a wealth of experience and really want to contribute. This was certainly true for Afra. She's found that returning to teaching as a volunteer has really helped her. I established a team for teaching online, especially during coronavirus. So I'm now I am have more than 60 pupils. They are in Syria, and most of them, they were with me in Aleppo. That's fantastic. They must be really pleased to be able, even though it's not the same as having you in person, they must be pleased to be able to see you. Yeah, uh, and that made me very happy because I started that when I was alone, before my family arrived. So I want to just to take myself off of this depression, to do something. So what are the most important things that we need to bear in mind if we want to support the mental health of asylum seekers and refugees? I asked Rachel what she thinks. I think I'd start at the widest level, which is about the environment we create for refugees and asylum seekers when they come here. We all know how if we go somewhere where we're made to feel welcome or unwelcome, even if it's just going to your GP surgery. That, that affects how we feel in that moment. These can have longer term effects. So I, I think it's about changing at that level. But even with the most welcoming environment in the world, undergoing such a big adjustment is never going to be easy. Afra has some advice for people who might be arriving in the weeks and months to follow. First of all, you don't think that everything will be very OK soon. You have a long of process and you survived from a very difficult uh, situation. And now you have another experience. It's so hard. Yeah. But because you, you, you succeed to survive, you will succeed too. So just be patient and don't feel that shame to ask because we have to ask, ask for help, communicate with people. In the same time, looking at yourself, you are here to just forget everything you suffered and try to enjoy this new country because you deserve that. Thank you so much to Afra for sharing her story with us and to Rachel Tribe. If you've been affected by any of the issues we've talked about in this episode, then you can find more information on how to get help on the podcast webpage. You can get in touch with us at scienceweekly at theguardian.com. That's it for today. Thanks for listening. We'll be back on Thursday. This is The Guardian. We all have goals, especially career goals, like enhancing and diversifying our skills or tapping into a broader network of opportunity. The Cornell Executive MBA is designed for goal achievers from any industry by advancing your career without any interruption, by providing global perspectives and intimate classroom settings, by challenging, informing, connecting, and propelling you. 
Achieve your goals with a Cornell Executive MBA on the weekend and close to home. Search My Cornell EMBA to start your journey.